Well, I want to invite you to take a Bible and turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 30, as we continue in worship this morning in the Tabernacle Message Series, Exodus chapter 30. This is our eighth week together in this series, and we have seen so far that the tabernacle is the place where God dwells with his people. This was the central place of worship in ancient Israel from the days of Moses in the 1400 years all the way to Solomon in the 1000s. 400 years, we know that this was the place where God was reversing what happened in the garden. In the Garden of Eden, God had fellowship with Adam and Eve. He communed with them. He walked with them. But because of sin, they were banned from the garden. Cherubim stood at the entryway to the gate with flaming sword. And so Adam and Eve lost the presence of God in that special communal way. And yet the tabernacle was a place where God was restoring relationship with his people. He literally tabernacled or dwelt among the people of Israel during the 40 years of the wilderness wanderings from 1446 to 1400. And then throughout the kingdom of the judges and Saul and David through Solomon, God taught his people about worship at this tabernacle. So, so far, we've looked together at some different parts of the tabernacle. We've seen the Ark of the Covenant and the table of showbread and the lampstand all inside, and the altar of incense all inside of the tabernacle proper. And then last time we were together, we saw the altar for brazen uh, sacrifice, the altar of brazen sacrifice outside the tabernacle in the courtyard. And today we consider another part of the tabernacle, the bronze laver, the bronze laver. Now remember, this tabernacle, this house was the place of the king. It was the palace of the king of the universe who chose to live with his people. And so we have seen that as a house where God dwells with his people, he had furniture in the house. He had a throne at the Ark of the Covenant. God had a table for food to eat at and commune with at the table of showbread. He had a light in the menorah, the lampstand. He had the altar of incense to make the place smell pleasing. On the outside, he had the grill for cooking the brazen altar. And today, we are going to see every house, of course, has a sink, has a shower to wash and be cleansed in. And God's house was no different. He had this bronze laver for washing and cleansing And today, may the Lord cleanse our hearts through his word. So hear with me the word of the Lord, Exodus 30, verses 17 through 21. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall also make a laver of bronze, with its base also of bronze, for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it. When they go into the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water, lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, lest they die. And it shall be a statute forever to them, to him and his descendants throughout their generations. This is the word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we live in a day of germs. (laughs) We live in a day where people are highly concerned about sickness, and rightly so. It's interesting this week, I, I read an article as we approach these first couple verses here, that I think are very applicable to remind us of why washing is necessary. Washing your hands is important. When average, you come into contact with 300 surfaces every 30 minutes, exposing you to 840,000 germs. Germs can survive for up to three hours on your hands. There are between two to 10 million bacteria on your fingertips and on your elbows. One germ can multiply and do more than 8 million germs in one single 24-hour period. There are more germs on your phone, 
your keyboard, and your cutting board then are located on your toilet seat. One in five people don't wash their hands, and of those that do, only 30% ever will use soap. The number of germs on your fingertips doubles after you use the toilet. 80% of communicable diseases are transferred by touch. Elevator buttons harbor 22% more bacteria than toilet seats. And lastly, there is, and I'm glad we haven't eaten yet, there is fecal matter on 10% of credit cards, 14% of currency, and 16% of cell phones. By the way, there is hand sanitizer on your way out this morning. Why in the world do I share all of these statistics with you today? Well, it's interesting. Before a microscope was invented, God gave a recipe for cleansing, the ability for the priest of Israel to be washed clean physically, but also pointing to the need we each have to be washed spiritually. In the outer courtyard of Israel, between the altar of burnt offering and the tabernacle proper, and the curtain wall which marked off the courtyard, you see it there on the screen, we find this basin for washing, the laver of bronze. This is the final piece of the tabernacle that we will consider individually together. It seems that this comes later than the rest of the items that were found in the tabernacle proper because the laver has special meaning for the priest of Israel. So it's not given in chapter 25. It's given in chapter 30 where the details for the priesthood of Israel are found. Now you'll notice this laver or this font was a large vessel containing a large quantity of water. It had no specific dimensions. And today I want to tell you where the laver bronze came from. It's interesting that this laver of brass where the water was stored for the washing of the priest was supplied by the women of Israel. You see, the women voluntarily gave up all of their articles of luxury. We are told that they had bronze mirrors in Exodus chapter 38. And the women who ministered at the tent of meeting, these godly women who prayed there and served the Lord there, they were willing to give up their mirrors of brass in order for them to build this laver of bronze. Now, why do I mention this little detail to you today? Well, I think it's a wonderful thing to give up something for your own appear from your own appearance for others' spiritual cleansing. That's what we call sacrifice. We see the willing hearts of the daughters of Israel. In an age where often the Bible is very wrongfully accused of being misogynistic and belittling to women, actually women are often lifted up as great heroes in the Scriptures. Just like in the Gospels we read of women ministering to Jesus of their substance. They provided for him in Luke chapter 8. And only women who washed the feet of Jesus with tears and anointed him. And of course, it was women who stayed faithful when the men fled from the cross. And it was women who showed up first at the empty tomb. So it was women who were generous, who provided. And it was not vain women, by the way, who provided. It was women who cared more for the worship of God than they did their mirrors, which many people would never give up their mirror, which may be the the, uh, the moral of the story is spend less time in front of a mirror. I don't know. I'll let you figure that one out. So we have a laver of bronze given sacrificially by the, the godly women of Israel. And it was for washing. And when I say it's for washing, that's a reminder that water is a very important part of the Bible. We are told in Genesis chapter 2 that there was a river that flew, flowed out of the garden and that it divided, and it seems that it watered the earth, that Eden was like a special haven that supplied water for the ancient world. And then when you keep reading the Bible, we see many more instances of water. For instance, you go a few chapters ahead, and we find there the story of Noah, and how water was used by God, that time not to supply the earth, but to bring judgment fiercely on the earth because of man's sin. And then we read about Israel in the wilderness and how God 
when the people were thirsty, had Moses come to the rock, and water flowed out of the rock and met the needs of the people in the wilderness. Fast forward to the New Testament. Jesus' first miracle is at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. What does Jesus do? He turns water into wine. And then we see Jesus before his crucifixion in John 13 take water to wash and cleanse the disciples' feet. And lastly, as Jesus hangs on the cross, dying for our sins, we know that water and blood flowed from the side of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the point here is that water is necessary for life. Now remember, ancient Israel comes to the tabernacle. What do they go first? They enter the courtyard. They have to go to the brazen altar. And there, blood is shed. You see, the sacrifices of the ancient animals are taken at the altar. But then they leave the blood and they go to the cleansing of the water at this font in front of the tabernacle proper. Reminding us you have to have your sins cleansed by a blood sacrifice before you could be washed in the waters of the laver. Now, please know, water is necessary for life. I know we live in the South, and a few of you, your kidneys are crying for more water because of how much sweet tea you drink. See, you laughed because it's true. But the reality is, we know, according to uh, health experts, the human body can last somewhere between only two and ten days without water, depending on the outside circumstances. We dehydrate, our organs fail, we die. And friends, spiritually, our bodies need water just as much as physically. Spiritually, our souls, our hearts are in desperate need of cleansing water. What does the psalmist say in Psalm chapter 63? He says there, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. What does the psalmist say in Psalm 143, verse 6? I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. You see, the Bible is very clear that there is something missing. We are dehydrated spiritually. Our tongues are parched spiritually. We've tasted of the goodness of God, but we need something more than simply a sip or a taste. We need living water. Now, the priests had to wash at the laver before they could enter the sanctuary, before they could go into the tabernacle proper. So, we see here entrance into the church of God by the institution of Jesus Christ is also by water. What do I mean by that? I mean that it is baptism which brings us into the church of God. You see, we know that you need to come to the altar for sacrifice first. You have to have the blood of Jesus Christ wash your sins away. But after that, what is the next step in following Jesus? The next step is water. The next step is baptism. What did Ananias say to Saul? He said, Saul, why are you waiting? Rise and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on Jesus' name. The point here is that when you are baptized, you are identifying with Jesus Christ. This is the biblical way which one who has had their sins forgiven at the altar, at the cross, shows everyone that they are ready to be a follower of Jesus, that they can come into the presence of God in the tabernacle. Baptism is what brings us into the church. Now, how do we become saved? We can become saved at the brazen altar. We become Christians at the altar. But you see, God does not mean us to live in isolation as Christians. He wants us to be in a body. God did not say, you are dogs. Aren't you glad, kids, that we're not compared to dogs in the Bible? We're compared to sheep. Sheep go in flocks. They go in flocks together in community. And so, baptism is our entry into the church. It is what identifies us publicly with Jesus and gives us the opportunity to be a part of his people. Martin Luther said baptism signifies 
that the old Adam in us is drowned by daily sorrow and repentance and perishes with all sins and our evil lusts, and that the new man daily comes forth and rises, who will live before God in righteousness and purity forever. The command here is that water is to always be ready in this laver, in this basin, for the priests to wash their hands and feet. You cannot come into the presence of God unless you've been washed. You cannot come into the presence of God. You can't be a priest of Israel unless you've been washed. We're going to see that in just a moment. Notice in verse 19, it says that this labor is only for Aaron and his sons. It's only for the priesthood. So before you could go and work in the tabernacle, you had to be washed in the laver. Now, this is a reminder that it's not good enough to be washed at home. It's not good enough for even good people to go into the presence of God on their own. Even good men, like the priests of ancient Israel, needed to be washed. You see, we are all in need of the sacrifice of the cross. We are all in need of the washing of Jesus. Even the good people that we look up to, the ones who are the heroes in our community, the ones that serve others, the people that we say, that's a fine moral example. I wish I could be like that person. Isaiah 64, 6 says that all of us are unclean and that our righteous deeds, the good works we do, are like polluted garments, filthy rags in the sight of God. So the priest can't wash themselves. They can't get rid of the dirt on their own. You see, the home is not where this happens. It has to happen in the sanctuary, in the presence of of God. You cannot get the sin out of your heart on your own. You might be able to get rid of one sin, but Jesus says seven more might come and take the, its place. We cannot cleanse ourselves from the defilements of sin. Listen, sin is not skin deep. The waters of the baptistry will not save you. The water alone will not take your sin away. The stains of evil are so deep and so dark in our souls only the divine cleanser can purge them away. And that only happens at the presence of God at the tabernacle. The prophet Jeremiah warned Israel, you can wash yourself with lye and use much soap in Jeremiah 2, but the stain of your guilt is still before me. Just because you outwardly look like a Christian doesn't mean your heart is inwardly changed. Too many people are playing church, playing follower of Jesus like it's a game. Brothers and sisters, it is not a game. Your eternal life is at stake. Take this very seriously. Jesus, when he was washing the feet of the followers, we are told that Peter tried to stop Jesus from washing his feet. And Jesus said, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. In other words, communion with God is not simply dependent on the brazen altar of sacrifice. It's not good enough simply to profess that you believe in the cross. But you need to be washed from the guilt and penalty of sin. You need the water and the blood from the side of Jesus to cleanse you. Now, it's very interesting when we look at the priesthood of Israel. It says here that this washing is for the priests, for Aaron and his sons. When we look at the history of Israel, we see that the priests had to be ordained, just like pastors are ordained today. At the ordination of the priest, it was a different type of washing than we read about here in Exodus chapter 30. In chapter 29, we are told that their whole body was to be washed. It was not to be done by the priest. It was done to the priest. In other words, someone else washed them externally. However, here in Exodus 30, the daily washing was only their hands and their feet. Now, what's interesting is the first washing, when their whole body is washed with water, is never repeated. It's a once-for-all washing. However, this labor in which the priests would wash their hands and their feet in happened every single day before they would enter the tabernacle. I think this picture is our initial washing at the time of salvation. When we are saved, Jesus washes our sins away. The blood of Christ takes away our sins. 
But we know that we still sin after we get saved. Sadly, none of us live a perfect life. And so, because only Jesus had a perfect life, we need a daily washing. We need to daily get right with God. This is why 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That's why when we come together as a church every Sunday, we collectively, corporately, confess our sins as a body to remind us, while we were once washed and saved at the cross, yet we need a continual washing every day. Every day we need Jesus. Every day we need His grace. Every day we need His help. Every day we need His strength. Every day we need His forgiveness. The Christian life is not a one and done. Too many churches have preached a false gospel that all you need to do when you hear those words, that's never a good sign. All you need to do is just join the church. All you need to do is shake the pastor's hand. All you need to do is just pray a little prayer. All you need to do is just give so much money. All you need to do is just be a good person. All you need to do is just attend once a year or twice a year. Friends, Jesus paid it all. It's not what you need to do. It's what Jesus Christ has done in washing us. And we do need to be washed. We need to be made clean. We are told in John chapter 3, Jesus says that we need to be born again. He says we need to be born of water. That is this washing, that first washing that happened to the priest of Israel. Born of water and born of the Spirit if you want to enter the kingdom of God. The Lord promised that if we turn to him in the new covenant, he will sprinkle clean water on us. He will clean us from everything that defiles us. And even the things we've put before God, the idols in our lives, he will cleanse us. I love the new way the New Testament crescendos this in Titus 3. It says there that Jesus saves us, not because of the works we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That, notice, he didn't sprinkle it, he poured it out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Friends, it's so beautiful to think that when Jesus died on the cross, when we think of the brazen altar, we, get, we can ask this question, what sins did Jesus die for? Did he die for all of your sins up until you committed a really bad one? Did he die for only your past sins, but not your present sins? Did he die for your present sins, but not your future sins? Did he die for mortal sins, but not venial sins? Or venial sins, but not mortal sins for all of my Catholic friends out there? Did he die for the little white sins, but not the great dark sins? Did he die for your public sins, but not your private sins? Or did he die for your private sins, but not your public sins? Friends, the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin, past, present, and future. He washes us clean. But the reality is we're still sinners. The, the great statement of the Reformation in Latin was simul justus et peccator. Simultaneously, I am justified and yet a sinner. God has made me right in that first initial washing, but I'm still a sinner in need of daily cleansing from God, in daily need of his grace and his help. Why? Because filthy thoughts still attack my mind, because filthy desires still fill my heart, because filthy things are still done by my hands, because filthy places have still been traveled with my feet. And while my sins are gone, past, present, and future, I need to daily be right with God and daily experience His presence and grace. We need the shedding of blood to remove sin, and we need the water of the laver to remove the dust, the defilement, the dirt that, has messes, that messes us up each and every day. It's interesting that this was located in the outer courtyard and not within the holy place. You could not get into the holy place or the most holy place without first being washed. Again, your hands need to be washed. Your works that you've done, they are polluted by sin. Our feet need to be washed because we've went the wrong places. 
Friends, this is why there are prayers in the Bible like Psalm 51. Wash me, Lord, thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Memorize that psalm. Memorize that verse. Pray it every day. Wash me, God. Cleanse me, God. Pray passages like 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. We know the saints in heaven have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of Jesus. And so, brothers and sisters, we need this washing. I love the fact that this old picture found in the tabernacle points forward to a greater reality in the Lord Jesus Christ. What do I mean by that? Well, it's interesting. When we read about the brazen altar, I mean the brazen laver, did you notice this was the only part of the tabernacle that dimensions weren't given. It didn't tell us how tall it should be, how long it should be, how deep it should be, how wide it should be. Nothing at all is given dimension-wise. I think this points to the fact that there is coming a day of unlimited provision by God for our cleansing. There will be more than we need to have our sins washed away. This is exactly what the prophet Zechariah said. Some of you who grew up in church, or some of you who have been worshiping here a while, you know the hymn that says, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. Well, friends, that wasn't first written by a modern hymn writer a couple hundred years ago. What you may not realize is that is the promise of God and the prophets of old. The prophet Zechariah said, one day, on that day, the day when Jesus comes, the Messiah comes, there will be a fountain opened and it will cleanse us from all of our sin and all of our uncleanness. This is not simply outward water. This is not some sort of a baptismal regeneration. As long as you're baptized in water, you're saved and you will go to heaven. Listen to me, there are a lot of baptized pagans in the world. There are a lot of baptized unbelievers in the world. There is a false teaching going around right now in the church, in many places. Some call it baptismal regeneration. Some call it federal vision. There's other names for it as well that teach that as long as you've been baptized in water... In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you are a Christian. And you will go to heaven when you die. Well, friends, that's like saying as long as a dog got wet, it's clean. I had to think about that for a while. Have you ever just smelt a wet dog without shampoo, without scrubbing and cleansing? All you got is a worse stench than you had before. And friends, there are a lot of people who have gotten wet in the baptistry whose hearts have not been cleansed by the cross. You can't get the order backwards. You need the, the brazen altar. You need the blood of Christ first before the water does any good. You need the washing of Jesus' blood before you'll have the cleansing of the water and you enter the church. This is why in Jeremiah chapter 4, the prophet said, O Jerusalem, wash your heart from evil, that you may be saved. How long shall your wicked thoughts lodge within you? It's not enough to be washed outwardly. Your heart needs to be washed by Christ and by Christ alone. A.W. Pink says here that the laver points to Christ as the cleanser of his people. The water is the word which he uses for it. I love the fact in verse 20, it says, Whenever they go into the tabernacle, nothing unholy could enter the tabernacle. Nothing unholy and unclean could enter the presence of God. You had to be washed. The blood on their hands from the sacrifices had to be washed. The dirt on their feet from walking in the desert had to be washed away. In order to worship God purely, you need clean hands and a pure heart. Friends, we should not come to church flippantly. We should not come to worship ignorantly. We should not come to worship without thought and prayer. You should not come and sing songs and mouth words without 
thinking deeply on them. We are told in Psalm 24, Who will ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who will stand in his holy place? Now the psalmist, of course, had in mind the tabernacle, and later the temple. But for us as Christians, when we read this, we know that every time we come together and worship, we come into the presence of God in a very special way where two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus said, they are with me in my midst. I am in the midst of them. So today, if you come with clean hands and a pure heart, we've ascended the hill. That's why the Lord calls us to worship every Sunday. That's why we confess our sins every Sunday. That's why we are consecrated by God every Sunday. Every Sunday when we are hearing the Word of God preached and hearing the Word of God read to us, our souls are being made clean. And that is why every Sunday we commune with God in the Lord's table because we have ascended the hill into the presence of the Lord. And we need clean hands and we need a pure heart. That is the only way we can draw near to God with a full assurance of faith. Friends, as we close the sermon today, I want to make one more point, And that is, how do you daily get cleansed? How, if you have trusted in Jesus, you're like the priests of Israel who were washed thoroughly. They're now priests. They're in the family of God. They're, the blood has covered their sins. But how do we daily get right with God? How do we daily have washing? Well, Ephesians 5 tells us that Jesus cleanses the church by the washing of of water by the Word of God. You see, God has not left us to figure this out on our own. He's given us the Bible. He's given us His living, breathing Word, His active Word. When you read the Bible, it's not like you're just reading another book. The Bible should be reading you. I've read many books. The Bible's the only book that reads me. And if you've read the Bible, and you're saved, and you've been washed, you know exactly what I mean. Martin Luther said, the Bible has hands and it lays hold of me. It has feet and it runs after me. Have you experienced the living God in his word like that? That's how you get washed every day, by, by prayer and by the word. Jesus said, you are clean because of the word. His prayer for the church was, God, sanctify my church through the truth. Your word is truth. The way our hearts are cleansed is by guarding and keeping God's word. If we would leave our hearts with God every Saturday night, we would find it with him every Lord's Day Sunday morning. But too many of us, we flippantly go through the days and through the weeks. I close with this last word from the Methodist preacher, Adam Clark. I want you to hear what Adam Clark said about pastors. When he read this, of course, this is a, a very applicable passage to elders, to deacons, to those who serve in the church. Because the priests needed to be cleansed daily before they could be of any good to God in serving him. And so, first hear what Adam Clark said. He said, what an important lesson this is for ministers, for pastors. Now, I know you're not a pastor, probably, but I want you to hear this. Every time they minister in public, whether in dispensing the word of God, or the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. They should take heed that they have a fresh application of God's grace and spirit to do away with past sins or unfaithfulness and to enable them to minister with a greater effect in God's divine favor and to have a divine unction to minister life and spirit to God's people. In other words, listen, a church that is not daily confessing their sins, pastors and elders and deacons, who are not daily being washed, is a powerless and a weak and an impotent church. All right? The power is not in buildings. It's not in money. It's not in entertainment factor. It's not in technology. The power is in a cleansed hand and heart seeking God in his word. That's why we seek to do that. Look, we're never planning to be the most technologically savvy church that we try to improve. We're never planning to put on the best show here or theatrical presentation, though we constantly strive to do better, excellence in all, and offer the glory of God. But here's one thing, as elders and deacons and as leaders in the church, we want to have clean hands and a pure heart. Because we can do nothing without that, nothing at all. 
While this is true of leaders in the church who need to be daily washed, it's also true of you, Christian. And so I want to now paraphrase what Adam Clark said. This is my version of it for you. What an important lesson does this teach us who are followers of Christ? Each time we start a new day, each time we leave our homes, we need to make sure we have a fresh application of the grace and the Spirit of Christ to do away with our past sins and unfaithfulness, to allow us to minister as Christ to our neighbor with greater effect, being in God's favor, bringing life to others. You need the daily cleansing of God. Friends, think about Jesus for a minute as we close. Jesus was perfect God, never sinned, never once gave into temptation. Jesus, who is perfectly holy and harmless, submitted to baptism in the Jordan River. His body was washed by John as a priest of God's people. Then he washed his disciples' feet. Then and blood and water flowed from Jesus' side. And today, he will wash you and baptize you in his spirit and change your life forever if you will look to him, trust in him, believe in him. In verse 21, it says, if you neglect to wash, you will die. In fact, God says it twice. If you're not washed, you will die. The holy God cannot be approached casually. Sin exposes us to death, eternal death in hell. The wages of sin is death, the wrath of God. And it is only the blood of Christ that will cleanse you and wash you. It is only daily repentance and faith which will allow you to be used by God in this world. We sang a hymn today that we're going to sing again in a minute. Rock of Ages. There's a line in that hymn that I pray will be more profound to you after this sermon today. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless, I look to thee for grace. That means on my own, I have no good works to bring to God. I need God's righteousness to cover me. I'm helpless. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Vile to your fountain, I fly, I run. Wash me, Savior, else I die. Wash me, Savior, else I die. Let us pray.